Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Welcome, welcome. On behalf of Coppin State University and the African American History Committee, we would like to thank you for coming out tonight for our event. And we would like to invite you to join us for the remaining of our events and our planned activities in the observance of Black History Month as we reflect on the accomplishments, the history, and the culture of African Americans. This year's celebration resolves around the theme, We Still Have Joy, in conjunction with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History's theme of Black Resistance. For more information on our planned activities, please go and log into our Coppin page, Black History Month. Again, I like to say welcome, and we hope you enjoy our amazing speaker, and right now, I would like for us to, we're gonna have greetings from Provost Dr. Pamela Wilkes. Good evening, good evening. Welcome, first and foremost, to Coppin State University, and as I like to say, the great Coppin State University. Uh, we'd like to welcome you on behalf of our President, Anthony L. Jenkins, our executive team, and in particular, we want to give special welcome and thank you to Dr. Julius Garvey um, for being here on this evening, for sharing, and for giving us some insight and wisdom. Uh, there is a legacy that is to be stated and that is to be honored and recognized, and tonight is one such opportunity for us to do so. And so on behalf, again, of Coppin State University, we welcome you to our campus for those of you who are new and for those of you who aren't, welcome back. And if anything, welcome home. And so again, on behalf of Academic Affairs, I'd also like to thank Dr. Savoy and the team who have put this together, as well as the African American Studies and our Committee uh, for this month of activities. I especially like to thank Dr. Bolden, Associate Vice President, for Academic Affairs and Associate Provost. Um, as a member of my team, thank you to Dr. Drury. Thank you so much for assisting and for moderating on tonight. And for everyone who joins us, we say thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued support of not only African American Studies, but also our students and our programmatic thrust here at the great Coppin State University. Again, thank you, welcome, and enjoy the evening. Good evening. On January the 5th, I received an email from someone named Carol Van Stone. And this email told me that a Howard professor, Justin Hansford, asked her to reach out to me to tell me about this distinguished gentleman who is seated to my right. In the email, she pointed out that Dr. Garvey, who is a retired board certified cardiothoracic <laughs> vascular um, surgeon, is coming to the Washington, D.C. area on a book tour. The email then went on to explain that he will discuss his father's powerful message that inspired many black leaders, including Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, along with Ma um, Nelson Mandela. The email also stated that in addition to that, Dr. Garvey was intended to provide an update on justice for Garvey, the effort to secure a posthumous presidential exoneration pardon for Marcus Garvey who, by the way, was wrongfully convicted 100 years ago in 1923. She then asked if I would be willing to facilitate his visit to Coppin. I looked and said, it's January the 5th. That gives me about three weeks to pull some stuff together. Well, she quickly responded to 
my email that said, I um, would like to explore the possibility. And every time I sent an email, within minutes, I got a response. So that encouraged me to even try a little harder. But even more than that, how could I, with any good sense, pass it up an opportunity to have the son of the historical icon, Marcus Garvey, on our campus? His claim to fame is not only his father, but this gentleman to my right has a distinguished career all by himself. I'm going to say a little bit more about him in a few minutes. But first, I want to say something about the also distinguished gentleman to his right, who happens to be one of us. And he will be serving as the moderator for today. This person is none other than Dr. Malcolm Drury, who is the chair of the Department of Applied Social and Political Science. He has served as an assistant professor of sociology at Coppin State University since 2018. Dr. Drury holds a PhD in sociology from African American University, from the African American University, as well as a master's in sociology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Jury's colleagues have considered him a specialist in survey methodology and quantitative data analysis. He is a former statistician in racial statistics, in the racial statistics branch of the US Census Bureau. Social science analysis for the government accountability office, better known as GAO, and a senior research associate for the National Academy of Engineering. He has written and published research papers on several topics, including criminal justice, child delinquency, gentrification, discrimination in sports, and community violence. In addition, he has delivered papers and presentations at the American Sociological Association, the Association of Black Sociologists, the American Society for Engineering Education, North American Society for the Sociology of Sports, and the National Science Foundation, to name a few. So you will see that the moderator has some things going for himself. <laughs> but now, for the star of the show. He said to make it brief. That's going to be kind of um, difficult. So I'm going to try and, and pick and choose as much as I can. Surgeon and medical professor Dr. Julius Garvey was born on September 17 <laughs> in Kingston, Jamaica to United Negro Improvement Association founder Marcus Garvey and activist Amy Jakes Garvey. He is the Younger of two sons, Garvey was raised in Jamaica and graduated from the Wilma Trust High School for Boys in a particular year. <laughs> he then earned his BS degree from McGill University in Montreal, Canada in the, 19, in the 20th century <laughs> and his MD, CM degree from McGill University's Faculty of Medicine. Garvey began his medical career by interning at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal. He began his first residency in surgery at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, completing his residency. Garvey also completed residencies in surgery at Harlem Hospital Center in, th <laughs> in Thoreau, thoracic, I think I got it, thoracic and um, cardiovascular surgery at the University of Maryland Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. So you see, he is familiar with our neighborhood. Garvey became an instructor in surgery at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. 
The following year, he joined the Albert Einstein College of Medicine as an instructor in surgery, later becoming an assistant professor of surgery. While teaching at Columbia University and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Garvey also served as an attending surgeon in cardiothoracic surgery at the Harlem Hospital Center and Montefiore Hospital. Now, there are so many other positions that he has held, but he told me to keep it short, so I'm going to skip two paragraphs. Garvey was a certified fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, the American College of Surgeons, the International College of Surgeons, the American College of Chess Physicians, as well as a diplomat of the Board of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery, the American Board of Surgery, the American Academy of Wound Management, and the American College of Phlebology. Garvey and his wife, Constance Lynch Garvey, have three children, Zynga, Makeda, and Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this distinguished gentleman for this wonderful um, conversation with our moderator, Dr. Malcolm Drury. Let's welcome him to Copper. Thank you, Dr. Wilkes and Dr. Bolden for the introduction. Um, one thing, Dr. Bolden, I went to American University, not African American University, so just to clarify that, but American University in Washington, D.C. I uh, want to make sure I, I give them a shout out um, <laughs> for uh, allowing me to attend there and graduate from there. <laughs> it's not the Coppin State University, but I appreciate it. Um, good evening, faculty, staff, and students of Coppin State University and Morgan State University. I'm glad to have some bears in the house um, with us this evening. Um, I thank you all for coming out and, and, and weathering the cold and the, the chill wind um, and coming over here this evening. Um, so we're glad that you're here, and hopefully this will be a great conversation um, that I have with the great um, Julius Garvey. Um, I am honored to be sitting in this seat this evening. And when uh, Dr. Bolden um, came to me about this opportunity, um, like I, I just couldn't deny it. Or and it's, I probably I know I have a hundred thousand questions um, for Dr. Garvey, um, but I also want to make sure that you all. I, I will have some questions. I do have some questions, but I also want to make sure that the audience. Um, has an opportunity to participate and ask some questions um, of this great man. Um, again, I'm elated to be here for this, um, you know, African American history event. Um, and we're here to talk about, like, um, the, the, the new book that uh, Dr. Garvey um, has just put out um, that's entitled um, The Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. Um, and there are three volumes of this book, and I know that the, it's on sale in the bookstore. If you haven't already gotten a copy, please make sure you do so. Um, I'm not sure if we have some available this evening here, but if we do, yes, we do. Um, please make sure um, you get a copy. Um, it is an outstanding book, um, a compilation of the speeches um, by speeches and uh, discussions um, by the great um, Marcus Garvey. Um, and um, Amy um, Jakes Garvey um, also. So she was part of compiling um, those, uh, those speeches um, together. And like, I, I do want to make sure we include her as part of the conversation because like, if anybody does not know, um, she was a great woman in her own right and did a lot um, to further the cause that uh, uh, Marcus Garvey um, had put forth. Um, so again, I'm uh, honored to be sitting here. But one of the first things, uh, Dr. Garvey, is like my, um, I have to say my first vision of your father is probably a picture that like most of us have seen um, of him. He's sitting in the back of the car. Um, he has on this, you know, regalia, um, that uniform, that hat. Um, and I just remember as a kid, like seeing that picture 
and like asking my father, like, who is that king? Like, he looked like a king sitting in that car. And I know it was a part, later on I found out that it was part of a parade, um, you know, in New York um, that was well attended. And I know we'll get to talking about that. But, like, like I envisioned him as a king, um, even at that age. Um, and I know he died, you know, early in your, in your life. But how is it growing up with this? larger than life figure, um, you know, just being present? Well, thank you for that question. Um, basically, you know, it, it gave me something to um, look up to and, and a great ideal because my father died uh, when I was seven uh, years of age. Um, I last saw him when I was five years of age. That's when we were in England and we came back to Jamaica um, at that time. And we, because the war was coming on, and my, my brother had arthritis in his leg and needed to come back to a warm climate. So uh, my memories of my dad, our childhood memories per se, but you know, my, my mother represented him um, um, to us, uh, us being myself and my older brother. He was three years older than myself. So she never remarried. She was a total um, 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 advocate of um, uh, his own uh, principles, meaning Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad, and mm, in general, African identity as a people and, and a people with a culture and a history that was longer than anybody else's. So um, she always represented that to us in the family as such, and um, you know, so that my father was always present. And um, it was always, um, you know, um, your father wouldn't want you to do that or your father would want you to do that in terms of um, example and in terms of stretching our imagination and, and, and the limits that we might impose on ourselves. So that we were always brought up to, shall we say, be as, as good as, or as great as we, we could possibly be in terms of how our father was presented to us. So, um, you know, it, it was fun. You know, at least I had fun. I think my brother may have had um, yeah, a little more problem because he was junior. He was Marcus Garvey Jr. So he kind of had to walk in his shoes, but I, I had my own shoes. But, but I, I tried to make sure that those shoes were appropriate in terms of the image of Marcus Garvey. Um, one of the things that I found or I, I find just really interesting in listening to the children of like these monumental figures, um, I had an opportunity to um, speak with and talk with uh, Bernice King um, years ago um, and her talking, talking about her father. Um, you know, uh, the, what you hear about Malcolm X as a father, um, Ralph Abernathy um, as a father, Louis Farrakhan um, as a father, like all of these um, men, you know, how we see them on stage and how we see them present themselves usually um, but they, they seem to always be loving fathers and men that, that took a time and opportunity with their children. Um, and and, and well, it wasn't just about like the speeches and things like that uh, for them. Um, but like, I, I always wonder how it is trying to you know, follow in the footsteps of these great men and, and your father being one of them. Um, like, I can't imagine like, what that is like. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I think I, I had my own shoes because I never really uh, wanted to be a politician in that sense or um, a, a leader of a movement. Um, very, very early on, I wanted to be a physician, and that sort of came about because um, at age 14 or so, um, I had a dog, I had a dog for a few years who was my favorite and used to go everywhere with me running in the bush and swimming in the ocean, etc., And my dog got sick. And um, there was nothing that we could do. He just lay down and, and eventually died. We didn't have vets or anything like that. And, and, and that was the loss of a great friend and uh, through illness and then death. So that motivated me to want to be a doctor to, to help people who were sick because I felt so helpless with my, my buddy, who was my dog. So, so that was the direction that I chose, as opposed to being a politician or being an activist in that sense of a movement and an organization 
that, that was championing the cause of, of African people. But it wasn't just your dad. Like, uh, your, your mom, um, you know, you and your brother grew up with your mom. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Amy Jakes Garvey was a force to be reckoned with, you know, globally in her own right. Um, she was, you know, the one who compiled his speeches um, and those writings. Um, she was an activist. Um, she was a feminist. Um, and she emerged as an intellectual figure, you know, after your father passed. Um, can you talk about your mom a little bit and her impact I can talk about her all day, so to speak. <laughs> because as you say, I did really grow up in a single parent home, so to speak, you know, from age seven uh, onwards. Um, and my mother was the dominant figure, and, and she was dominant in terms of her personality. And the way she tells it, of course, she used to challenge my, my dad, you know, she was his, his intellectual equal. And, you know, they met in New York, uh, they were both from Jamaica, but they met in New York at one of the meetings of the UNIA. And, and she had a background, she was very well educated in terms of going to Wilma's Boys School, which she preceded me in that. Um, but she had legal training, uh, you know, as, uh, as uh, a legal secretary, which again, in her day, that was phenomenal for a woman to have that kind of uh, training. So, you know, uh, she met my dad and she questioned him about what had happened at the meeting and so on and so forth. And over a period of time then, he asked her to come to work for the organization because she had those skills. So she went to work with, uh, at, at, in the organization, again, taking care of their books, which are in disarray. As you know, we didn't necessarily have all the most competent people at that time in the 1920s and earlier. Um, so she brought that to the organization. And um, she's the one that developed the women's page, you know, in terms of her articles and, and, and what was presented there. And as, as, you, as you mentioned, you know, she, she um, was an intellectual in her own right. And when my dad was, was imprisoned, um, um, in terms of the false charges, J. Edgar Hoover, et cetera, um, from 1925, uh, uh, um, she collected um, his speeches that she thought um, were relevant, as well as his writings. And she put them together, and of course, with his approval, um, she published them. And that was volume one and two of the philosophy and opinions of, of, of my dad. Volume three was done later on, but she also um, uh, compiled those along with a Nigerian named Essian Udom, who was a Nigerian um, um, nationalist. So, so she was responsible for a lot of that in terms of, you know, putting my father's message out there in the public when he was incarcerated. And um, she carried the UNIA to a large extent um, um, uh, after his imprisonment. And then, of course, he was deported when, when his uh, sentence was com um, commuted by Calvin Coolidge in 1927. So you know, they, they came back to Jamaica and um, uh, she was involved with the UNI there and that's where she had her two children, two sons, myself and my brother. But she, she, she maintained that um, characteristic, so to speak, and she got involved in politics locally uh, in Jamaica. My father created the first political party there, the People's Political Party. And then he left in 1935. And my mom, you know, uh, as I mentioned, came back to, uh, to Jamaica. And, and she continued there uh, politically with the People's National Party, which was a different party, um, but espousing very similar uh, ideas at, at the time. So she was a, a politician, she was an activist, and then a number of, of young uh, leaders, uh, our coming leaders, so to speak, um, um, would, would well, learn from her what the movement was all about. People like, like Tony Martin and, and, and Rupert Lewis, and, and others um, who, who were, you know, coming into the movement of African liberation um, back in the 60s, etc. These people came and learned from her what it was like in the movement, what it was like in terms of organizational structure and so on. So she continued to be a mentor to many of the, the young uh, activists. As I mentioned before, she brought up myself and my brother um, on her own, you know, um, with largely some of her own resources. She became a builder and contractor um, with the, the, the land that was deeded to her by, by her, her parents. So she was um, uh, quite an all-around accomplished uh, female. As you say, she was a feminist before her time um, because, she, you know, she espoused 
the equality of women, and she considered herself the equal of my dad, not his, not his second uh, in command, but really equal to him. So, you know, I'm obviously very proud of my mom, and, and you know, I think she did a good job in terms of raising me. <laughs> she definitely did, and uh, um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure yeah. we, we brought her up and talked about her and her accomplishments, because, like, I know I read Garvey and Garveyism um, years ago, um, but even reading philosophies, but, like, you know, her uh, 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 contribution. That was not just a compilation of my dad's work. Garvey and Garvey Garvey was her own book, per se, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love the way um, Dr. Garvey just kind of said, like, you know, my dad just created, like, one of the first political parties in Jamaica. Um, um, the, just first. the first, the first political party in Jamaica. Um, like, these great accomplishments and things that he wa was able to do. And it's interesting, like, um, this week, especially, I, I've been, I was excited about this, um, but I had been asking people questions. You know, do you know who Marcus Garvey is? Um, do you know what he accomplished? Um, you know, not just, you know, in the United States, in the Caribbean, but, you know, globally. Um, and his impact went, you know, far beyond just, you know, what you hear about him. Um, and his impact was, or his impact to us was, you know, bringing about an African global unity. Um, but most of the people that I talked to had no idea um, or heard little about him. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask you, uh, and, well, in my opinion, um, and some of the, the opinions of others, he's probably one of the most unappreciated leaders of African people in our modern times. And I, I wanted to ask you, why is that? Why, 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 why is he treated that way? Um, I think it's, I, mean, I know that it's, it's because he represented the, the, the solution, uh, the blueprint for the liberation of, of African people worldwide. You know, one of the first things that he said is that we must liberate our minds from mental slavery because while others may help us to free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. So he advocated the, 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 the knowledge um, um, of who we are and who we were in terms of our ancestors. And he also said, you know, that, that a, a people without the knowledge of their past history, traditions, and culture is like a tree without roots. And he took us back to, to Kemet, took us back to Ethiopia as the birth of, of civilization. And, and that we are the first people and the first civilizations. So he took us beyond slavery. And, and he said that we were the first civilizations and what he was bringing was a revolution of the mind to reconstruct and recreate African civilization. So if you reconstruct African civilization on the basis of African humanism, the principles of, of, of African cosmology and so on and so forth, then of course you, you, you destroy the supremacy of, 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 of Eurocentric thinking, because Eurocentric thinking is different from Afrocentric thinking. So, so he, he brought to the fore what we needed as an African people um, post-slavery and in the midst of colonialism. So that was a tre threat to the, to the colonial system in terms of the French and the English, as well as to the apartheid system as it existed here in the United States in the 20s, because we're still being lynched on trees and so on and so forth. To some extent, we're still being shot in the streets, but I guess that will come later. But you know, the point is, at, at that time, um, you know, um, um, soldiers who were fighting for democracy, African American soldiers, were coming back in uniform. You know, 1914-18 war, and they're being lynched in uniform. And they went back home and expected to be treated like human beings. So, so that was what he brought to the table. That you know, it, it was not about the dominant culture that had oppressed us. We, we didn't want to be equal to that. We wanted to be independent and, 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 and manifest who we were as a people in terms of our own traditions, our own philosophy, our own cosmology, and of course our own spirituality, whether you want to call that religion or not. So, so he was a, a total African person, which was denied 
by um, Europe and Europeans, certainly Americans of European ancestry, as well as the French, the British, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and so on and so forth. So you represented a threat uh, to world domination by, by uh, Europe and European thinking. And, and I, I do want to make sure we, uh, we talk about that a little bit, too, mm -hmm. um, because uh, we, we've mentioned you know, thus far you know, the uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association, um, UNIA. Um, but it, it started and began in the, in the United States um, in May 1917. Um, one, one of the first chapters were formed in New York City. Um, but within months of uh, that organization's formation, um, it had two million members um, you know, from all over the United States. Uh, by 1920, the UNIA had over 1,100 chapters um, in 40 countries around the world, including the UK, Cuba, Panama, Costa Rica, um, Ghana. Um, and by 1926, the membership of the UNIA had grown to over 11 million members, which is amazing. And we're talking about like before pretty much 1920, between you know, 1917 and uh, 1926, 1927, um, which is absolutely astounding. Um, he built the largest black organization um, in, in history. Um, and he's not given the credit that is due. And that bothers me so much. Like, why, um, you know, why is this not recognized or talked about more? Well, I think Carter G. Woodson wrote about that in the 1930s, the miseducation of the Negro. So, you know, we, uh, we're still laboring on the, the on miseducation because a, 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 lot, a lot of what we learn in school uh, is written by the people who have oppressed us over time and have commi committed so many atrocities against us and, of course, the Native Americans and others. Um, so that our minds are still being um, uh, compromised, shall we say, uh, and, and conditioned by the system that we exist in. And if you look over time at, at the way in, in, in which the system works, um, um, anybody who may be antagonistic to the system or wants to change the system or does not want to um, 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 obey the system, uh, the, the first thing that, that, uh, that happens is, is they become demonized. You know, whether the Panthers were de demonized, the black Muslims were demonized, Mugabe in Zimbabwe was demonized when he wanted to take the land back from the white people who came there and stole it. So that's the first thing they do is demonize you. And then, and then the second thing to do is criminalize you. And then if those two don't work, then they kill you. You know, Martin Luther King was killed, Malcolm X was killed, the Panthers were wiped out. So this is, this is the way in which the system works. And, and they were able um, to destroy, in a way, Marcus Garvey by criminalizing him and then deporting him. Now, if he wasn't deported and if he, if he was able to obtain citizenship here and continued his work, they would have killed him. For sure, you know, uh, as it was, you know, the Jamaican government, which was a colonial uh, uh, territory, uh, again, they, they imprisoned him as well. You, you may not know that, but he was imprisoned in, in, in Jamaica as well uh, because of his political activity and what he said about the judges, the British judges who were there, and that they were, if they were unjust and needed to be punished and sent back to England and so on and so forth. That was considered to be a crime against the Queen. So they put him in jail for three months, uh, you know. And, and they were preventing him from holding elected office and so on. So it was a system, and it still is a system, that, that um, you know, promotes itself to the expense of everybody else, which is unfortunate because I think now we're going to enter a multipolar world. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, after, after describing, like, how many members of the, the UNIA and the impact that he had globally, but just to talk a little bit about, like, how he inspired black movements um, into the 20, 20th century and what we see now, um, you know, both in Africa and, and in the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, when I think about it or uh, or look at this movement, um, the, the black Muslims in the United States were inspired by um, Marcus Garvey's movement. Um, in fact, Elijah Muhammad was 
uh, a member of uh, UNIA in uh, what, Detroit and Chicago. Um, thinking about uh, Malcolm X and you know his movement and his philosophies and his thoughts. Um, and it just didn't come from Malcolm X. His, his father, um, Earl Little, was a Garveyite. Um, so like his philosophies stem from you know his dad, um, and just thinking about uh, Martin Luther King's uh, movement, especially towards the end of of his movement, uh, movement uh, with the with the Poor People's um, Campaign or the Poor People's Movement, um, and moving into that economic development um, and and bringing you know everybody into that fold. Um, like you hit it right on the head, I guess. If you hit certain trigger, triggers with uh, those people that are in power, um, they're going to find a way to um, to take you out. But like I was just amazed to to know about even that uh, several African presidents uh, were influenced by the work of Marcus Garvey. Um, but I, I also want to turn our attention to the current state of like Pan Africanism um, in, in, in the United States. Um, and I know the movement, and if, if I'm surprised that more people don't know the motto of um, the UNIA, one God, one aim, one destiny. Um, and your father talked a lot about uh, disunity um, and not being together. Um, and when I look at what's going on right now, um, we're still in that place. Um, can we talk about can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think what you said is is unfortunately uh, uh, true. I think one of the 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 the, the primary um, philosophical, if you will, basis of of uh, European uh, uh, culture um, and philosophy is is individualism. It's materialism and individualism, and unfortunately, we we have internalized that to a, a, a significant degree. Now, I think it's, it's okay if you're part of the system because the system has already come together to create a space for you. So within that space, you can be an individual and compete for resources, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've been marginalized by that system, and you need to break out of that system. The only way you can do it is not by individualism. You have to do it by collectivism. Because that's how the system was created in the first place. It was created by the army that came here and destroyed the Native Americans. It wasn't one individual who came here and spoke to them and says, you know, I want this piece of land. No, it was an army, a collective army that came and said, we're going to take this. Politicians came along with them afterwards, Roosevelt, and so we're going from sea to sea. And they killed and killed and killed and killed until they got from sea to sea. That was a collective. And you did not disobey that collective. Uh, <laughs> you know, otherwise, they would, they would kill you on the spot or court-martial you or do whatever. So, so the only way that you can really change the conditions under which you live, if they are oppressive, is through a collective, through the unity of more than one person. Because no one person is powerful enough or bright enough to have all that is needed to create a new environment. And you know, you just have to look at it historically in terms of the movement of people out of Africa and all over the world. They moved in groups. It wasn't an individual. You can't go anywhere and form a new community as an individual, or even as one family. You have to move in a group. And, you know, they went to Europe, went to India, went to China, and so on and so forth. So, unity is of primary importance, and as you say, that's what he emphasized, and that was the purpose of the organization. And of course, it's difficult to maintain that unity unless you have the mentality that allows you to participate with the group. Because, you know, as, as my dad said, you know, the, 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 the things that you do for yourself that are selfish go no further than yourself. But uh, what you do, you know, for all in, in, in context, then that goes even until eternity. 
You see, and that's a very African concept because eternity, you know, we, we talk about the ancestors, you, you know, we, we, we talk about being born, born again. And, and we're here with, with a purpose to, uh, to fulfill during this particular lifetime. And we're carrying out what the ancestors wanted us to, to do. You see, so basically, uh, the African way of thinking is always as a collective. Uh, you know, and, and we, of course, know, you know, that we were, we were, we were created. I mean, again, you know, my, my, my dad said, you know, you know, God and nature first made us what we are. And then out of our own creative genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. You know, follow always that great law, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, um, uh, eternity is our measurement. I mean, that's a complete cosmology telling us that we, we, we were made in the image of God and nature. We are part of nature. So, so again, everything is just one, one collective with the divine and, and with nature and with us. So, so that's the culture that we come from. And we can only get back to that and get out of the system by being collective and, and reconstructing that particular culture. And I think that's, that's what he was trying to do, recreate um, uh, African civilization, and, and unity is essential. I, um, I, I found it interesting, like given, like everybody knows last week um, what occurred um, with, with Tyree Nichols. Um, and them or him being, you know, beat by um, five black men, um, which was as disturbing in itself. Um, and when you talk about unity, what I saw on that TV screen made me think of, like they've taught us to hate ourselves. They've taught us to fear ourselves. Um, and they seem like they've worked so hard at making us uh, separate, as you say, to work within their system. How can we get back to the collective system that your father was you know, trying to create, you know, with everything that he did. Well, yep, you know, you're perfectly right in that we have internalized so much of, of that system that we we are um, doing the job for them in terms of brutalizing ourselves, in terms of black and black violence, and so on, which you saw demonstrated so so much with um, with Tyree. Um, Again, we go back to the quote that I just made uh, not too long ago, liberate your minds from mental slavery and miseducation of the Negro. And we have to educate ourselves. And, and, and that's, that's, in some sense, a difficult task because the educational system that we have, again, is largely controlled and largely dictated and, and largely uh, funded, uh, et cetera, by the system that oppresses us. And you can see what's going on. Um, I'm sorry, maybe losing my voice. Um, I've been talking a lot the last few days. But you can see what's going on now in, in Florida with, with um, uh, DeSantis. Uh, DeSantis they, don't, yes. they don't want us to even know about African American history in terms of what has been done uh, to us over time. Um, they're afraid to look in the mirror to see themselves. And, and they just want to continue with, with the system that exists, which really oppresses us and brutalizes us and prevents us from being the full human beings that we really are. So, so that's the problem. And, and we need an educational system for ourselves that teaches us about ourselves and the struggle. And you know, I, I forget the, the name of, of the months that you're celebrating, uh, the joy, or something about the joy of who we are as a people. Um, we can be joyful in the sense of we have survived, but the real joy is joy in being yourself, your full self. And that's what we still have to struggle uh, in terms of how we manifest our joy, because it should be joyful for us um, to live fully as human beings. That's what it's all about. And, you know, the, the happiness really is in ourselves in terms of um, in the, way, the way in which we, 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 we live moment to moment. That, that gives you joy, except if it's in a negative environment that, that, that oppresses you and prevents you from being your, your natural self. Because again, it's about natural systems and God and nature first made us who we are and we make ourselves within the context of God and nature. So it's a natural term, the situation that we're living in and it's not joyful as we would like it to be but we take joy in what we have accomplished, but we will take greater joy in what needs to be done in terms of true freedom and liberation of us as a people. Just um, 
you know, listening and 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 uh, and reading some of uh, Marcus Garvey's speeching speeches, like what you're talking about here, I, I find those speeches are talking about love and unity, um, and what we need to do to be together um, as a global unit. Um, and I always find it interesting how he's always portrayed in that negative light um, to make it seem like he was, uh, you know, not trying to, to just just to promote like we're we're not together. Um, but just to highlight some of the you know the accomplishments of, and things that he did um, for African people like all around the globe. Um, because the, the, the Garveyite movement was different from any other black movement that has ever, we've ever seen in history. Um, and he was able to accomplish and do things that have still never been done before. Um, the creation of you know, self-reliant um, communities and businesses and organizations. Um, the UNIA had an assortment of like businesses, you know, you know, such as the Black Star Line that we haven't talked about, um, that I hope you all will, you know, look into and 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 know what that was all about. Um, but that was a steamship company. Um, the newspaper publication. Um, he had a newspaper. Um, you know, the the ma he had a manufacturing business. Um, you know, uh, restaurants, um, all kinds of stores, um, laundromats, a doll factory. A doll factory. When I when I saw that, I said, "Really? Why? Why do we have a Why do we have a doll factory?" But again, it's going back to self love and identity. And this preceded the Brown v. Board of Education. Um, you know, the looking at the doll test. Um, but like he he created this doll factory um, for little girls to see themselves as being beautiful. Um, even back in Jamaica, he uh, promoted and um, came up with this uh, pageant um, for, you know, a black pageant to, you know, show women that they're beautiful um, and, and, you know, have, you know, joy and respect for themselves. Um, so he did all these great things, but again, those things aren't really talked about. Um, and, you know, as we are at the beginning of Black History Month, I hope that, you know, we will take this message um, and take what you're saying and, and move that forward to promote his ideas and philosophies. Um, also, everybody, I, I do want to make sure I open this up to, to, to some questions uh, for everybody else. I don't want to hog like uh, all of uh, Dr. Garvey's time. So if anybody has any questions or anything like that for Dr. Garvey, please um, come up to the, the, the mic uh, that we have in the center. <laughs> well, I'm actually a um, basketball coach, so thank you for okay, noticing that. <laughs> um, I want to greet you guys with one God, one name, one destiny. Yes, it's a blessing to be here. I am actually the president of um, the UNIA in Baltimore, Marcus Garvey's organization. So it's a blessing to be here. Um, we need to let everybody know about Marcus Garvey. It's very important. I had a question for the doctor. And um, in that letter from Atlanta, which was one of the most powerful letters. He spoke about your mom and making sure us as a people took care of her. And um, he also spoke about a lot of phenomenal things in there. I think that was the first time he said, I'll see you in the world when it things of that nature. But just talk about um, the mentality he had of learning and teaching. Um, a lot of people, one of the greatest books I think he ever written was um, The Course of African Philosophy. And um, all of those lessons up there from teaching leadership to propaganda, um, diplomacy, it's just so powerful. Um, just talk a little bit about how those lessons came from him and from your mom and that he instilled in you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, you know basically um, he, he said that intelligence you know, rules the world and ignorance carries the burden. And, um, you know, his whole life was spent in, in learning and improving himself 
and, and he talks a lot about in, in that um, uh, a book of African philosophy uh, that was just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, he talks about, you know, uh, uh, reading, you know, widely reading four hours a day, carrying a dictionary around in your pocket and learning, you know, two or three words every, every day and making sentences uh, uh, with them. Um, he, he would uh, compete in elocution contests. He would go and see this, the speakers, uh, as in, in Britain, in the parliament, or he'd go to the churches and see how, how they were able to communicate with their audience and so on. He would go in front of the mirror, he'd mimic their gestures. So it was all about you know, self-improvement and, and education. But the key point was critical thinking. It wasn't about memorizing what other people had said. But as you know, education, ex do carry to lead out of what you need to, to have is, a, is the ability to think critically. That means your mind shouldn't be in a box. And that's where he came up with this business of liberating your mind from mental slavery. Because if you just read and memorize and then uh, repeat what it is you've memorized, then you're nothing but a machine. But to be fully human, then your mind must be flexible and, and be able to, to think critically and, and analyze things uh, uh, critically, and then use your own creativity. And because again, we go back to that particular quotation, that you know, God and nature made us what we are, but out of our own creativity, we make ourselves what we want to be. So it's, it's about education, it's about self-knowledge, and then it's about manifestation in terms of your own creativity to deal with the problems of life, or, or just you know, everyday living. Um, it's up to you and your, your mind. It's a mind creates, and anything you desire in, in nature, um, you can use the, the, the intelligence of your mind uh, to, to accomplish that. So, so he was very much a, a mentalist, if you will, but then he was also very much a spiritual person, realizing that it's the spirit that guides the mind, and it's the mind that commands uh, the body. And, and, and he said... Um, uh, uh, man, man is the individual, you know, that, that, that can, uh, you know, master uh, his, his will, um, uh, create his own, own, own character, and therefore also shape his own destiny. So it's very much um, giving the individual the power to be the best that he could be. And, and I think that was what, that's important, and that's what's still missing in terms of who we are as a people, understanding that we have the power to be the best that we can be. And, and that power is something that's inside ourselves. And that is something that we, 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 can, we can master that power, use that power well, um, with our creativity, to, then to create whatever circumstances that we want so that we should not simply look and blame somebody else for our failures or the situations that we're in, but we have to look internally for the solutions. And that's what education is all about, is to give us that ability to, to think of something new and creative, uh, to deal with the obstacles that you see in front of you. Because what happened in the past and your memories of the past does not necessarily equip you for the problems that you face today. The only thing that's going to allow you to solve the problem is to create a solution to the problem. So you have to have that access to your own creativity Remembering all, always that you're made in the image of God, therefore you have all the potential that there is in the world. So you have both the potential and the power. Yeah. Good evening. So my question for you um, is specific to the Negro world, uh, the newspaper. Um, more so outside of that medium in reference to create, you know, share information, promote businesses, um, highlight, you know, positive things that was going on amongst black folks. Um, was there anything else he utilized? Was there uh, radio as well, or um, even short film in ex to an extent? Um, but most important, I think most importantly too, the, more so the infrastructure of it. How did it operate in reference to being able to meet, reach so many people in so many other states? And Did I answer that, please? 
Yeah, um, you know, I think by and large it was the newspaper and um, his, his um, ability to, to travel and, and, and his charisma in terms of de delivering his message. Um, um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at, at, at his life, so to speak, started out in Jamaica and then left Jamaica, um, went to Costa Rica, went to Panama, um, um, and Nicaragua, a couple other places there in Latin America, came back to Jamaica, then went to, to England, traveled all around the continent, to Ireland, to Scotland, France, Italy, and so on and so forth, came to the United States. Within one year, he traveled through 38 states on his own dime. So, you know, um, it, this is how you access information. That's not necessarily in books. And, 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 and this is what we talk, mean by education. All of your education is not going to come from at the university or the high school or whatever. But it's also out there in terms of what people do, the dialogue that you have with people and so on. So he, he understood what America was all about by, by going through 38 states in one year. He didn't have to read necessarily 100 books about the Civil War and so on and so forth and be able to quote as the scholars do, you know, with a bibliography of 100 and so on and so forth. He went there and he talked to the people. But that's a little bit by the way. But it's illustrative also of, of what he did in terms of the, the, the organization to promote it. Number one, of course, was the Negro World. It had the greatest circulation of any um, black weekly at the time, um, much, much more than any of the other uh, papers. And of course, it was carried around the world by members of the organization. And, 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 and different um, uh, seamen and so on working on ships. They would take it to, to, to Africa, different uh, places in Africa, as well as uh, throughout the, the Caribbean. Um, you know, there were great penalties in many of the colonial territories against anybody having the Negro world or being able to read the Negro world. As a matter of fact, Jomo Kenyatta in his book, Facing Mount Kenya, um, tells the story that they would get the, 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 um, the Negro world and um, um, uh, different um, uh, villagers would, would gather around and, and they would read a particular the editorial page of Marcus Garvey and they'd read it several times so that I could memorize it and then they'd run back to their different villages with the message from Garvey. So that, that was the, the, the Garvey Telegraph, if you will, as well as the Negro world. And again, him traveling you know, all over. I mean, he traveled to Canada, he traveled all over the US, he went back and forth to the Caribbean. He never got to Africa, but the, the paper, newspaper did get to Africa. So that was the methodology. And um, um, it, you know, I think his, also his, his ability to organize and, 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 and to create, um, as, as was mentioned here, you know, there, there were more than uh, a thousand um, 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 liberty halls, if you will, aspects of the organization in more than 40 countries. So they were able to, to propagate from, from there because they had the information and they would propagate the information from there. So it was able to go worldwide with those means, you know, before social media and the internet and so on. Just to, to follow up on that um, for everybody else too. So the Negro World was the newspaper that Marcus Garvey created. And at its peak, it probably had over 200,000 you know, publications in circulation. Um, in in that newspaper, they would feature like um, like reports from the UNIA chapters, um, poetry, um, literary um, excerpts would be in there. Um, there was a women's page, which um, his mom was the the, the uh, you know editor of that page, um, and there was commentary that was significant to Black people across the globe, and like it was social media before social media it spread across the globe which was you know part of how you know we could see how large that movement actually was um, at that time and again we are talking about the 1920s you know right I was ready I was ready to say that yeah so the editorial was in French and Spanish um, also, so I mean, it, it went all over, and it was interesting. It got so big at one point that the colonizers, you know, felt that it was a threat, you know, to the world, um, and it was outlawed in several different countries: um, Belize, uh, Trinidad, Guyana, 
Um, also in Jamaica, they outlawed it, uh, its circulation in Jamaica. Um, so again, everybody, when we talk about his message of unity and love, um, you know, that's not the message that, you know, they wanted to um, spread or hear. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm very honored to be in your presence. Um, I have a quick question for you. What is a piece of advice that you would give to my generation as we try to build, as we try to bridge the gap of battling ongoing social injustices and fighting for change? Social injustices. And fighting for change. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, hold your mic. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to holler at you. Um, I started. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of what, what I've been saying is relevant, you know. Um, primary, it's, it's individual transformation. Um, it, because, you know, if, if you're, if you're not, not committed, and, um, and that means, you know, essentially uh, uh, 100%, then it, it's not going to happen. You, you're going to get caught up in your own ego and your own individualism. And you, you're going to argue and have discussions about trivialities, and you're going to miss you, you, the, bigger the, the bigger picture, you know, and you have to keep your eyes on the prize, as they say. So, so it's definitely you know, uh, about that. And, and as I mentioned before, you have, you have a, all, all the power and you have a, all, the, all the potential. But again, you know, my, my, my dad said that without confidence, you're twice defeated in the race of life. But I can tell he poured a lot into you. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry, sweetheart, what did you say? I can tell he poured a lot into you, like confidence-wise, because just the way that you speak. Okay. You said with, with confidence, you've won, you know, even before you've started. And that's true. I mean, if you're confident in yourself, you know, you have all the potential. You know, you just have to do it. And you, you do it step by step, day by day, and so on. And you never give up. And the change will happen. You know, people around you will change when they see how committed you are and how confident you are about, you know, what your purpose in life is and what you're trying to accomplish. So confidence is important and recognizing that you, you, know, you, you have the power, right? So, so exercise the power. Uh, master your will. Exercise that power. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi there. Um, so me personally, when I speak to like my peers, um, they won't know who Marcus Garvey is. And like we was just talking about, like in the 1920s, he was very popular and he had a lot of movements. So where did the disconnect come from? Where, why don't people know, a lot of people in today's time know who Marcus Garvey is and what he did. Why is Pan-Africanism not a uh, very popular, where did that disconnect come from? Yeah, very, very good question per se. I, I think we mentioned something of that and that the system, you know, um, tries to destroy those who are the leaders of, of, of that type of uh, movement. But there are also, you know, uh, some internal problems in terms of ideology. Not everybody believes the same thing. And if you go back to the period of, of Marcus Garvey, um, the ideologies that were competing against him were the ideologies of, of, of communism at the time, because that was um, the, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia was 1917. So communism became a worldwide movement and, and was uh, trying to replace capitalism, so to speak. And, and many you know, um, uh, African Americans um, uh, felt that their own liberation would be assisted by becoming communists, um, because the communists would support them, et cetera, um, once they, they joined uh, uh, the party. So that was one group of people uh, fighting for, for an audience with, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, the black electorate, shall we say. And then there was another group of people, and it's interesting, because the NACP is here, and the NACP has changed over time. But the NACP, don't forget how it started, you know, back in 1910, it was largely created and supported, you know, by white liberals. And, and they saw the, the way for African people, African Americans to go forward was, was to integrate into the white community because they were liberal in terms of their ideology. 
and, and, and this was, you know, um, uh, like a W.B. Du Bois who had been educated in the system, his PhD in Berlin and, and, and Harvard and so on. And so he was uh, educated in, in the elite system of the people who oppress us. And he was supported by, again, liberal white people. So integrationism was one of the other ways in which to go. Marcus Garvey uh, advocated independence in terms of our, our own identity as a people with an African culture and an African history so that we didn't have to imitate anybody. Um, you know, obviously there were advances in terms of the Industrial Revolution, et cetera, et cetera, that did not take place in, in Africa, it took, took place in Europe. But of course, we are the ones that fueled the Industrial Revolution because we were enslaved, with free labor, created the wealth that created also the Industrial Revolution. So we didn't have to uh, take any sort of back seat uh, in terms of the Industrial Revolution. So we could use, and this is why I mentioned something about not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but we could use the developments, the modernization that came out of the Industrial Revolution, but we didn't need to give up our identity or our culture or our way of life. So it was an independent way. And, and, um, and, and this was what uh, a lot of people um, wanted, you know, coming out of the enslavement process, coming out of, um, you know, the sharecropping, et cetera, in, 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 in the South, and moving north um, uh, with the First World War, and, and being involved in, 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 in the ma manufacturing of the North, which was needed at the time of World War I with uniforms, artillery, and so on and so forth. That was a new experience. But what African people wanted was to be able to have a job, have land, to develop their own communities, because they didn't really want to be part of what was oppressing them previously. They wanted to get away from that. So that's why you know, millions of people embraced the Gavi movement. So, so that's some of the divisions that, that have occurred over time. And, and, and be, because of the strength of the Gavi movement, and then the system came after him. After him. With J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, that was the beginning of COINTELPRO and so on and, and so forth to destroy that. And then that allowed the other movements to arise. But in destroying Garvey, also they went after the communists. But then, in a sense, the integrationists were the ones that were allowed to develop, shall we say. But that's a false premise. Because, you know, how do you integrate um, when one is down here, the other one is, is up here? unless there is reparations. But of course, there were no reparations. There was no reparatory justice. If you integrate as you are. So you're always going to be the ghetto, and somebody else is going to be the superior person. So you're integrating into a society that was not created for you, and that has not changed you know, since the beginning of, of, of the country, and certainly also since the Civil War. Um, so well, I think we see it now, 100 years after Garvey, if you will, that, um, you know, there are superficial changes, but the system hasn't changed. So that, that's part of why we're not further along, because we've been caught up into that whole business of um, equality on somebody else's terms and integrating into somebody else's culture and somebody else's system, which will always be at a disadvantage. Um, also, let me, let me add, I think he nicely said the uh, uh, Marcus Garvey had a lot of enemies, um, including the NAACP. Um, du Bois, and me being a sociologist, and me, you know, figuring that, or, or, you know, I feel like I'm a Du Bois scholar, and I've always wondered why there was so much animosity between um, these two polarizing figures. Um, but Du Bois did a, a lot in trying to, like, dismantle what Marcus Garvey was trying to do. And also, as um, Dr. Garvey just mentioned, um, the, this was the beginning of the FBI. It wasn't the FBI then, was it? No. Um, but this was the beginning of the Department of, of Justice. The, the the part, the right. So this was the beginning of J. Edgar Hoover's career. Um, and I, I believe Marcus Garvey's movement, the UNIA, was one of the first like uh, organizations, black organizations that were Im infiltrated by the FBI. You know, they used people within the organization to try to dismantle the organization. So those are things that we continue to see 
we continue to see during the 50s and 60s, especially during the Civil Rights Movement, Black Panther Party, um, and you know, even Dr. King's movement, um, and the Black Muslims, um, those type of things that, that thwart any type of effort to bring everybody together. So we still face those type of uh, you know, things going on by the federal government and, and other people also. Hello, we talked in the other room earlier. My name is Faith Rogers. I'm a junior social work major and Miss NAACP. Um, do we have a question limit? <laughs> do we? Because <laughs> I have some, I have a couple written down, but I won't say all of them, but say two, three. Cool. Okay. Um, Let's go. <laughs> um, what was the most important lesson you've learned from your father or your mother? Uh, the, the fact that you can really be anything that, that you want to be uh, in terms of your mental capacity and your power to un un accomplish your purpose in life. Okay. And um, are there any African countries that you know have um, processes, in, processes in place that make it easy for African Americans to return to live? And have you ever thought about or planned to move back to Africa? Our plan to move back to Africa. Well, moving back to Africa. Me personally? Yes. Okay. Uh, there are several countries that have reached out. Uh, Ghana reached out in 2019, the year of return. Mm -hmm. um, Liberia is, is reaching out. Um, uh, Sierra Leone is reaching out. Uh, Senegal is reaching out. I was uh, recently, um, maybe a couple of months ago, um, in Dakar, Senegal, and. Um, there's a thriving uh, community there, and, and they're trying to bring more Americans there, if you will. And, um, you know, there's a significant movement now in terms of Americans uh, going back to live on the continent. As you know, Chance, uh, the rapper, just had a, a concert there in Accra. They call it the Black Star uh, uh, concert, I guess in homage to, to my dad, and yes. etc. Um, um, so, you know, um, it's, it, it's there at the level of hip hop and so on. As you know, KRS One was always a very strong uh, Garveyite and, and, and nationalist, if, if you will. So, that is, it's, it's rising again, shall we say, and it's permeating the culture and, uh, in terms of Pan Africanism and the, and the fact that the, the continent is there for us in terms of resources and that we can go, go there and live and, and, and um, you know, develop economically. And it's not just for the Japanese, the Chinese, and the French, and, 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 and um, the Turks, and, and, and everybody else in the world. It's also there for us because we are the progeny of, of the continent. Um, and while you know, many of us are late to the table, and my father was talking about this 100 years ago, but um, it, it's, it's um, coming around again in terms of this generation um, identifying with their Africanness and understanding that we're a global uh, people. And, and not only can we visit Africa, but we can go there and, 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 and live and, and help Africa to develop because we have so many resources, uh, both economic as well as intellectual resources. And Africa is the richest continent in the world. Good evening. We spoke in the other room as well. My name is Michaela Davis. I'm currently president of the health science major and also junior class president. And my question to you was, do you feel that the generation today is doing its due diligence to be the leaders of tomorrow? Like how you, your father, Malcolm X, Dr. King, um, Angela Davis, leaders like that, do you feel like we're doing what we can to make it better for our children and grandchildren? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sure that all universities are not the same, and I'm sure some are doing a better job than, than others. Um, uh, so I can't speak in a generalized sense. But by and large, again, you, you know, the, the, the educational uh, uh, syllabus, et cetera, uh, and, and um, um, the, the books, et cetera, that are available are, are to a large extent dictated by the people who, who pay for the education in, in terms of, you know, we're do the HBCUs get their funding from, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, who then, then shapes the cu curriculum and decides, you know, what, what can be taught and what cannot be taught. Um, 
But, you know, I remember it must be 20 years ago, um, the, there was a lady in charge of, of the HBCU. She may still be. But, you know, me and my naivete, I wanted to link the historically black colleges with the African universities. And I had contacts. I went to Ghana and, and the, the, the office that was in charge of all of the African universities was in Accra. And I went there and spoke to them and so on and so forth. And they came up with an MOU to link the HBCUs with the African universities. I, I brought it back and, and gave it to this lady. And, and you know, and we had a significant conversation, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, they were going to follow up with it and so on, link the HBCUs with the African universities. Of course, it never happened. You know, and, um, you know, and, and it's a shame to see, you know, um, you know, so many African students, you know, on their breaks and so on. Uh, they go to Europe, and then, or they go there to study. They don't go to Africa, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot that is missing, you know, but it's not a condemnation of all the HBCU as if they're all in one basket. I mean, you know, look, look at what's happening here. And this is a significant effort, I think, moving in the right direction to expose you all to me and to others like me. So, uh, you know, more of that needs to be done. And, you know, everything is a process, too, as a matter of fact, because W.E.B. Du Bois, in his later years, he said Garvey was right, and he was sorry for what he had done to destroy Garvey. Um, you know, and I think the NACP over time has also changed and is much more radical in terms of its understanding of the system as it exists. And, and today, they, they will not try to negate Garvey. They'll, they'll be on the same bandwagon as Garvey, so to speak. So I, I know how you feel, because when I was your age, I... I thought the revolution was going to be tomorrow, and I was getting ready for it. But <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> and not even on television. So <laughs> as Brother Malcolm said, it won't be on TV, but it hasn't happened. So um, you know, keep on keeping on. <laughs> Thank you. All right, sweetie. <laughs> one, more. one more question? So Dr. Oh, two. Gar There's a lady that stood up two. there. OK. Oh, two we got questions. two more questions. That's it. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. So Dr. Garvey, I wanted to ask, yeah. um, Recently, the U.S.-Africa summit took place in Washington, D.C., and 49 African leaders came over to the United States. So I wanted to ask, why is there not a more um, uniform approach on the continent in terms of geopolitics and um, international relations, especially given our history and, you know, um, with the global north? Okay, I, th I think I heard everything. Did you hear everything? Why is there not a more unified no, approach geopolitically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. Um, uh, as you know, the Organization of, of African Unity was formed, what was that, back in 1963, I think it was. And, and then you, you have the, 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 uh, the African Union in 2001 um, uh, with a different mandate. Um, to try to bring um, the, the, the countries uh, uh, together um, with more responsibility uh, to a centralized uh, executive uh, body. But of course, they're still individual countries, even though they're regional blocks, they're five regions. But they, you have to understand that the AU is, is not a federal uh, system. We're st still uh, moving, if you will, hopefully towards a federal system of a united uh, African states, or whether you want to call it the United States of Africa or United African States. But well, the, w what you're saying and what Marcus Garvey wanted back in 1927 when he talked about the United uh, uh, States of Africa is a federated system for Africa so that it's a geopolitical entity. This is also what Kwame Nkrumah uh, wanted uh, to bring about, but the other nations didn't want it. So he was frustrated. Uh, and uh, he, he wanted one, one government, he, he wanted you know, one army in terms of security, and he wanted you know, one, one economy, per se, uh, as a geopolitical unit. And you see, we're still struggling with that. You know, the, the leaders came here. You know, why didn't Biden go to Africa? One man could go to Africa instead of 49 people coming here. I mean, you know, that's a waste of money, time, uh, gas and, and, and so on in terms of climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So that just shows you the inequality and the way in which the African leaders uh, see themselves. If I was an African leader, I would say, no, I'm staying where I am. If you want to talk to me, come and see me. 
you know, but we haven't reached that, that degree uh, of independence because, you know, we know what the CIA would do to such an African leader, and he would depose, be deposed the next day, as, as has happened over and over and over again. Um, you know, so th that's still a problem, and it's still the way to go. As you know right now, there's the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is a move in the right direction, but of course that has to be accomplished. Uh, it means you have to break down customs barriers between different countries. You're going to have to end up with one visa or one passport to travel and so on and so forth. You have to open up the airspace over different countries. So there's a lot of work to it, and, uh, and it's happening as a process. Too slow for you, too slow for me, but it, it's a process. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be here, not only because I'm a psychology student, but I'm also an African American studies student, so I feel like I have 100,000 and one questions, but I just have a personal do, question do, do for you. Do you know Linda James Myers' work on optimal psychology? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you know Linda James Myers' work on optimal psychology? No, but now I'm interested. Please, <laughs> please, absolutely. Go and read that. So I just had a personal question. Um, did you ever feel as the child of the Garveys um, that you were obligated to um, maintain this kind of his, you know, connection to history? Or did you feel because you were instilled with so much pride that it was almost necessary to keep, you know, keep this message moving throughout your life? Yeah, you know, I, I never sort of felt what you said in the first part of your statement. Because as you know, you know, I, I've been a doctor and, um, for more than 50 years, so that's my profession. Um, but uh, you know, I am, I am, I am a child of the Garvey's, if you will. So I do, do have some responsibility there if, if, if I agree with the ideology. And of course, I agree with the ideology because it's about me and, and it's about you know, um, um, valuing my identity. And, 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 and understanding my true value as a human being and being able to manifest that. So, you know, I have mixed the two, shall we say, over time, but um, I'm paying more attention, of course, to my, my medical studies because that's what it demanded, or my medical service, I should say. But I've been retired now for the last three years or so, just before COVID. Thank God I, I retired just before that particular catastrophe. So I devote a little bit more of my time now to, shall we say, spreading the message. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're entirely welcome. Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Garvey did Marcus and Amy a, uh, <laughs> a very good job in, 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 in holding up the Garvey name. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, I know I love this. Um, again, I was excited about being here and participating in this with you. Um, I'm glad everybody else could be here and participate in this and ask some excellent questions. I hope we can take this and move this forward, like actually move, like get into the movement, um, learn more about it. Um, learn more about what Marcus Garvey stood for and, and what he uh, tried to accomplish um, and have more discussions just like this. We can do this, um, like he set the precedent for us, like we can get together amongst ourselves and, and talk about and discuss a lot of these things. So I want to thank you again for being here and I know Dr. Bolden has a presentation for you. Yes, and Dr. Garvey, I hope you remember that I am not the one who mentioned anything about years, right? Thank you for that. Right. This was good. Um, when we were planning this and decided we were going to have it on the Friday, we had two choices, the Friday or the Saturday, and we said we'll do the Friday. And then when this cold weather came through, folks said, well, why are you going to continue with this? No one is going to show up. You proved them wrong. And I want to thank you for your um, thoughtful um, questions. And so we hope that you, Dr. Garvey, that you realize that Coppin is one of your launching pads. You've given us some um, charges. You've inspired us. And we hope that this first visit will just be that, the first, and that there will be many more Right, and we hope, and, and I know, hope that I'm not um, stepping um, 
out of bounds, but um, I think I'm close enough to the um, provost to be able to say that I'm sure the provost and the um, president would, uh, would join me in welcoming you, welcoming you back here to Coppin. And I do want to recognize the, our students from Morgan State University who came across the other side of town. Our, our friends from the east came to the west to join us. And we do want to acknowledge um, your presence. Let's give <laughs> our Coppin friends. Thank you so very much. And, and we have to also I, I just, celebrate. I just want to say that when I spent two years in, in, in Baltimore at, at the University of, of Maryland doing my cardiothoracic work, I, I lived near uh, Morgan State. So I'm, I'm a favorite of Morgan State as well. So thank you for coming. <laughs> In fact, as I ask the leaders of the African American History Month um, committee to come forward, would all of the students who are here please stand so we can get a sense of how many students were here? Okay. Come on, let's give them a. Uh, they could have been elsewhere, but they chose to be here today. So let's uh, celebrate them. Thank you so very much for joining us. Dr. Davis, Dr. Savoy, and, we're, and they're going to tell you who needs to come forward at this particular point in time to receive a little token of our appreciation. Provost Wilkes, can you stand alongside with us? I definitely want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much to the Division of Academic Affairs, our Provost, Dr. Um, Bolden, I really appreciate, as well as the Department of Applied Social and Political Sciences. Thank you, Dr. Drury. We really appreciate it. So, Dr. Garvey. Oh my God. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, can you, um, Shakasha Tori come, please? Shakasha Tori, thank you. Please forgive me. This is Dr. Garvey's associate. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much for all of your assistance. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Dr. Garvey, on behalf of the great Coppin State University, we want to honor you on this evening. We want to thank you so much um, just for your words, for your thoughtfulness, for your courage, for your tenacity, and for just representing all that is what is in terms of our community, our people, and our struggle. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us on this evening and for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts. And so on that note, we want to give you these thoughts <laughs> on behalf of Coppin State University. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's been indeed a pleasure in terms of my being here and interacting with, with the students. I know they say it's common to, to say that the future is in your hands, but it definitely is in your hands. And I think that you're going to be well prepared coming out of Coppin State uh, University for the future. So all the best to you. And thanks very much for coming here uh, to listen to an old man share his thoughts <laughs> with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Earlier you would have heard some references to the books. Now, when we tried to get the copies of the books in the bookstore, I was told that they needed six weeks. But I do want to acknowledge Dr. Mary Wanzer. I'm not too sure if she's still here, but she's all librarian. Yes, she's down to the back. She'd, she'll probably kill me for recognizing her. But she made it possible for us to have a few books here this evening. We wish we could have given them away 
for free. But we are giving you these as a gift for only $15, which is a significant discount. Now, the other challenge is that we can only accept cash or checks. So if you have cash, if you have a $20 bill, I have some change of $5, so don't sweat it, right? But, um, but we'll, um, or if you do not have, oh, there's a machine downstairs, the ATM downstairs, I, I was made to understand, so you could always slip downstairs if you have a card. No, we don't have an unlimited supply. So if you want to get a copy of the few books that we have, immediately following this session, please join me in that room where you would be able to get a signed um, copy. But I'm going to ask Andrew Brzezinski. Oh, I'm looking around for you. And how did I miss you? Um, we would like to at least, if possible, get, see if we can get a picture with the students and Dr. Garvey. So before we go back for the book signing, or as we prepare to for the book signing, I'm going to ask if the students who are here um, can come to the front for, if you want, for a picture with Dr. Garvey, if that's okay. Okay, if, um, just one minute. The provost has asked if, he, if a picture can be taken with the smaller group with us first, and then don't leave, don't leave. Please, students, don't leave, and then we'll get the bigger, more impactful picture with you. Okay, and another request has come for one with the Morgan State students um, first, and then the Coppin students will bring it home. Okay, so first we'll get with the faculty and staff, then we'll get with the Morgan students, and then we will end with the Coppin students. Dr. Wanza, I know you're going to kill me, but if you're here, we would love it if you 